Welcome to the Funk Unplugged Any% Percent Speedrun Explanation video. The video playing in the background is the current world record, which sits at 40 minutes and 4 seconds. The first and most important explanation are super jumps, which are the main movement tech of this game. By going to perform a crouch jump and inputting a second jump button press as the original jump is about to go off, much more height than intended is gained. This allows us to skip a lot of barriers and gives us a quick and easy way of getting out of bounds in most levels. This first level, Trouble Tropics 1, is a simple tutorial level where super jumps are shown off quite frequently. Not all super jumps are created equal. When holding the sprint button down, less height is gained, but you keep the property of sprinting, which allows us to cross most large gaps. When the sprint button isn't held, more height is gained, but it's much harder to move horizontally. In each level, a platinum record must be reached and activated in order to mark the level as completed. When we reach the platinum record, we can pause the game and quit to the main hub to skip a small cutscene. Treble Tropics 2 is a very simple level, but it does have one thing worth mentioning. Ampy, the character you play as, has the ability to freely move during most cutscenes. This is used in a few places throughout the run. Since nothing else is really going on, I'll go ahead and explain the layout of this game. There are four hubs, each with three levels and a boss fight. In each level, there are up to nine golden records, which are used to obtain power-ups that allow us to progress through the game. However, in order to keep the golden records and unlock the boss fight in the hub, the platinum record in each level must be reached and activated. This signals the end of the level. Levels and new hubs aren't actually available until the corresponding power-up is received from the Move Master. To access the final boss of the game, each boss must be defeated, meaning that there is no way that we know of to skip any levels or boss fights. Travel Tropics 3 is the only level with some slight version differences. In older versions of the game, the water in and around the level has no collision, meaning that you can freely go into it without dying. This opens up two routing options based on your version of the game. Once exiting a specific cave, you can either go towards the water and run through it to reach the next area, or you can backtrack slightly towards a gate and jump over it. Both take about the same amount of time, but going through the water is much easier and a little more reliable. However, I personally play on a later version of the game where this is patched, so my only option is to go over the gate.
We're on to the first boss fight of the game, but that does not make it the easiest. It actually has the most potential time save. The objective here is to destroy three tanks on the back of the boss's body. It's possible to destroy two of these tanks at the same time, effectively skipping to the last phase of the boss fight. However, the positioning for this is quite finicky, so it can be pretty rare to see it happen in a run. We've just unlocked the first power-up, the wall jump. It's pretty self-explanatory, you just use it to jump off of walls. However, it's not normally used in a run except as a backup when a super jump is missed. We're now in the second hub of the game, Arctic Area. The first thing you'll see is the only true 2D side-scrolling section of the game, where you can only move left, right, up, and down. Most of it is, as usual, super jumped over, so it's over pretty quickly. The rest of this level is extremely straightforward, so there's not much for me to mention. At the end here, you'll see that I start activating the Platinum Record, but stop before it's completed. This is because of the last Golden Record that needs to be obtained. However, starting the activation isn't just for show. The Platinum Record actually keeps track of how long you've been activating for and stores it, meaning that you can easily walk up to it after collecting the Golden Record and activate it much faster than usual, saving a small amount of time. Arctic Area 2 is, once again, another mostly straightforward level. There are two things worth mentioning which I'll get to in a little bit. This room is a little weird. The point of this room is to go around and activate some rocks that have lock symbols on it in order to open the door. However, the door itself doesn't actually have any collision, so you can just walk right through it.
This elevator ride is one of a few auto-scroll sections of the game. In order to dodge most of the things falling down, you can either run around or you can simply super jump on top of the pillar in the middle of the platform. Once a certain point is reached on the elevator, a super jump can be performed from the top of this pillar in order to try to hit the checkpoint, which is a stationary point that is activated by Ampy crossing it. After doing so, you can jump off the side and get teleported to the top, saving a couple seconds. However, in the world record run, I failed to hit the super jump, so you get to watch the ride of shame as the elevator ride is actually completed. Arctic Area 3 is one of the most interesting levels of the run for a few reasons. To start, let's talk about graphics optimization. This level runs poorly on NVIDIA graphics cards, including the 2080 Super I use, due to a hat that is collected after around a minute and a half to two minutes. This causes low frame rates, which can affect super jump timings very slightly. Let's talk about the checkpoint I just collected. It loses about a second to collect, but ends up saving about four to five seconds due to the death warp that is utilized inside of this room. The hat I just collected is the hat that causes a lot of the frame rate issues in this level, so not only do we have to collect the hat to complete the level, but it also helps everything start running smoothly again. The final thing I'll mention is that this is one of two levels that is done, for the most part, completely as intended. The area that has the platinum record to leave the level is too far to super jump to from any point that we know of, meaning we actually have to gather the four presents in order to enter the workshop. When in the workshop, we also have to destroy all the enemies in order to open both barriers due to there being no known way to get around those barriers.
Arctic Area's boss is the easiest boss of the game for a couple of reasons. The first is that by standing on this rock in the corner, the smoke balls that should damage us simply don't and can all be concentrated into one corner. The second is that by death abusing, the purple smoke lines that should appear on the floor simply don't, meaning that we are free to run around without worry. Finally, his snowball is extremely easy to dodge if you're focusing. All this means that most split timings will end up in a very small time window that is about one to one and a half seconds long, making this the most optimized level of the game. The second power-up we've obtained is the ground pound of this game. It's not quite as useless as the wall jump, but it's still not used very often. This is used to activate pressure pads and is supposed to be used to open Beethoven's castle, the next area, but by doing a couple of super jumps over the gate, we can activate the trigger that automatically opens the gate for us permanently without having to use the power-up. The first level I do is actually the second level of Beethoven's Castle. This is a little outdated as I now do them in numerical order, but this was originally done because I thought doing the second level was a little faster than doing the first level. Turns out it wasn't. This level is more of the same, with super jumps being used to jump over all of our problems, making this an extremely short level. One thing worth mentioning is that in the final water section, holding sprint while going over the vines makes it impossible to go over them without dying. This is due to sprinting lowering how high you can jump. You have to not hold sprint in order to make it over. The first level of Beethoven's Castle has two somewhat interesting aspects to it, even though we're going to be super jumping over all of our problems once again. The castle gate we jump over takes a lot longer to actually open intentionally, so jumping over this saves a lot more time than doing it normally, which isn't very common for this game. The platinum record for this level is locked behind a gate we're supposed to open, and we could super jump our way out of bounds to activate it, but it's much easier to just run up against the door and activate the record through a small crack. Okay. 
Beethoven's Castle 3 is one of the longest levels of the first three hubs, and it's the other level that's done, for the most part, exactly as intended. To access the end of the level, multiple vines with a purple glow around them need to be activated throughout the level. There's not a lot of mention here, it's just more super jumps, but I will mention a couple things when they do come up. In this room, the objective is to use the ground pound in order to activate four numbered switches. This opens a gate, allowing us to activate the vine in this room. It's possible to get to the vine before opening the gate, but the vine itself isn't usable until the switches are activated, meaning we actually have to do things intentionally here. The vines we've activated allow us to get to the Platinum Record, and there's currently no known way to get around the barrier, preventing us from getting to the record. So like I mentioned before, this means that this level is done mostly as intended. Alright, now onto the boss of Beethoven's Co. Wait a second, where are we going? Well, we don't actually have to beat the boss of each area to purchase the next power-up, and there's something in one of the final hub's levels that we can use that makes the boss of Beethoven's Castle a lot easier. So we're going to get that before doing the boss. Since we've unlocked all of the purchasable power-ups now, we don't have to stop to collect any of the golden records. This means that our objective for the rest of the game is to get to the end of the remaining levels as fast as possible. Since there's no record collecting, everything in this level is something you've seen in a previous level, so I'll be back when the next level is here.
In New Tempo City 2, we get the final and most powerful power-up of the game, the Glider. This allows us to get over large gaps normally, and when paired with super jumps, allows for some insane platforming. Just watch the rest of this level with the Glider and know that most of this would not be possible without it. Now that we've gotten the glider, it's back to the boss of Beethoven's castle. The next three levels take over 10 minutes to complete, which is one-fourth of the run. There's a decent amount to unpack here, so let's get started. The important thing to note is that you should not move during this initial cutscene. While Ampy will move, the camera position will not, and due to this level being a chase sequence, moving too much will make it so that Ampy is off the screen. This makes it so that an already difficult level is impossible without memorization. Alright, with the most difficult boss out of the way, we're on to the most difficult non-boss level of the game. This level contains the hardest sequence in the entire run, and it's conveniently placed about 5 minutes before the run is over.
This hallway is, in my opinion, the killer of most good runs. It's an auto-scroll sequence that features one-hit mines, constantly moving lasers, and requires you to constantly hit the blue orbs in order to keep gliding on top of the water. It is very easy to mess up in this segment, but it is possible to super jump your way around it. However, doing so loses about 20 seconds, and with my current sum of best and personal best, it's not viable for me to do this, therefore I'm required to do the most difficult segment in the game. Alright, with the most difficult segment of the run over, all we have to do is perform a few super jumps and we're on to the final boss of the game. Welcome to the final boss fight. This fight features four phases, each with multiple moves that are performed. I'll go ahead and explain each of these moves. First, up to five blades can be thrown in a sequence. They come out at two fixed but alternating heights. Three smoke balls can be thrown, which damage you if you walk into the smoke. When the floor goes purple under you, it means that a claw is about to pop out of the floor and you need to run around to prevent that from happening. When he charges at you, it's simply a charge. His main attack, and the way that you can actually hit him, is where he charges up the laser on top of his head. By activating one of the mirrors, it stuns him, allowing us to hit him and get to the next phase. The charges I talked about before have a little bit more to them due to the fact that there are two types of flooring in this level. There is solid and graded. If he charges and pounds onto a graded floor, then that floor will drop temporarily, exposing purple liquid. Falling into this purple liquid means instant death and requires you to start the fight over. The final move is a spinning laser that you simply have to jump over. While it may seem like there's a lot to remember, it's important to know that the final boss follows the exact same sequence of moves each time you fight him, meaning you can easily memorize and prepare for each phase of the fight if you're concerned.
With the final phase over, we can walk up to the boss and activate him in order to end the game. Timing for this run ends once the final cutscene starts. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment and I'll answer as best as I can.